In Touch is a student project of the television production class at Briarcliff College. I'm Linda Harchie, and this is In Touch. Today, my guest is Tom Peterson. Tom is a weather director at KCAU mm -hmm. Channel 9. Welcome to our show, Tom. Thank you. It's good to be here at Briarcliff, and it's good to be on Siouxland Cable Conference. Mm. Could you uh, tell me just a little bit about what you do as the weather director at Channel 9? As little as possible, Linda. I, uh, I, have, I have general responsibilities for the weather department, but with a guy like Scott Mayo, who's our meteorologist and needs no direction from me, it's really just a matter of coming in and doing the weather at 6 and 10. Uh, I have some input into the, into the format of the weather and some input into the graphics and some input uh, into severe weather coverage. But as I say, if you work with folks like Scott and the other people at the station, it's real easy and it's just a matter of coming in and doing it. Okay, so the meteorologist uh, gathers all the information and then you sure. do the presentation on yeah, it. Sounds the easy, doesn't <laughs> it? Right. It sounds like a deal. Now, how many and years, it is. How many years have you done the weather? Um, next March it'll be 15 years. And all those years here in Sioux City? Yes, yes. And it's uh, the first time I've ever done a television job. It's my first deal on TV, so I'm working to kind of get it down before I do anything else. <laughs> um, now, after 15 years, when you walk outside and look up in the sky, do you have any special abilities now that come <laughs> to you that you can predict the weather? I've got this elbow problem, <laughs> and uh, no, I, I, uh, I really don't have any special abilities. What I, what I think you get after 15 years is just repetition. Uh, you do it so often, and you deal with one subject so much that some things finally sink in. And so, yeah, in a sense, you go outside and and you know when you feel the air and you know it's too cool to produce tornadoes that that you're not going to worry about it in the area that you're in for instance Sioux City now it may be the tornado producing weather is capable in the eastern part in Sac City but you can have sort of an instinctive feeling that there's not going to be a tornado in Sioux City and even though there's a watch out you can sort of alibi it to, to affect people to the east rather than the immediate Sioux City or areas to the west. So yeah, in a way you do, but it comes just from having done it year after year for 15 years. Um, that's about the extent of it. Okay. Now, have, are you usually right on target with your weather forecast? Oh. Have you made any gross errors in the forecast? Have you ever seen any gross errors? <laughs> Some no. would say just by arriving it's a gross error. <laughs> um, no, I, I, uh, I don't think that weather is that accurate yet. I think there are lots of gross errors. Uh, it's, it's a case of the science of weather doing the best it can, and the best it can do is for the immediate future for the immediate six hours doggone it they're good for the immediate 12 hours they're pretty good for the next 18 hours the accuracy as it were falls off a little bit 24 hours falls off a little bit more by the time you talk about uh, the next three months it's it's just anybody's guess they they have computer the National Weather Service has computer models of the of the weather that they think will come about and a couple of them and they compare this model and that model and they make some pretty good educated guesses but taking nothing away from all of their work i don't think that they yet have the ability to predict months in advance and the odds go down i think that the the best predictor of weather is literally the odds for instance, if you ask me what is the weather going to be this winter, I would say the odds would favor a hard winter because we have had so many easy winters. And it's just time that we get dumped on. But to say that the National Weather Service says, or, and I'll, I'll be fair to them, to say that the Farmer's Almanac says that is the height of lunacy. I know there are old folks who love to say, well, the Farmer's Almanac said, but I read the Farmer's Almanac, and I know, or the old Farmer's Almanac, there are two, and people don't make any distinction between the two. I know that they say there's going to be a big snow in the central part of the United States on December 27th. Well, how much difficulty is that? You know, 
somewhere in the middle part of the United States on December 26th. Good chance. Somewhere it'll occur. Sure. But um, they don't know any better. They're, they're, that's entertainment. Um, the, the Weather Service produces what they call science, but as you get farther out in the reporting periods, it's more entertainment than anything else. So now, do you get any calls at the station, people that complain that you've predicted a sunny day and they have a picnic and it rains? You always get complaints, sure. That's America, doggone it. That's why we're here. Uh, do you have any particular complaints not that serious. sticks out in your mind? No, not seriously. If, if people really believe, they, sometimes they have good reason to, to have a beef, but very rarely do they take it that seriously. Okay. Better not, anyway. That'd be pretty silly. Now, you grew up in Sioux City, is mm -hmm. that correct? Mm -hmm. And, and then, still am growing up. <laughs> so, um, and where did you go to uh, school? I went, in order of appearance, to Bryant Grade School, to North Junior High School, uh, to Central High School, and then to Morningside College. So I literally completed my educational experience in Sioux City. Mm -hmm. And was your major mass communications? No, they didn't have mass yeah, it was it was in the old days when they didn't have a mass communications uh, major. My major, strangely enough, was history and political science. I really like those two things. I really like history. I, I'm I'm convinced that unless we realize and appreciate history and know history, we're doomed to repeat it. And I mean, there are a lot of things that I'd rather not see us repeat. Mm -hmm. So you wanted to be a politician? So, no, not at all. I wanted to be a teacher. Hmm. I really wanted to be a teacher. And I, I about the second year in college, uh, was a part of that great thing called the draft lottery. And people my age, I'm 43 now, and when I was in college from 1966 to 1970, they threw all eligible men uh, into the pool and and they drew lottery numbers and the very first person picked the very first date picked whatever it was June 19th those with birthdays on June 19th were picked number one to be drafted so, so what, what they knew number? 58 58 good number good number <laughs> I was so excited to know I'd won uh, I said <laughs> What's the prize? They said a three-year or two-year trip with the, with the government. And I, I uh, knew then at about my second year in college that as soon as I graduated or if I for some reason dallied and dropped out of school, bam, I was draft material. So my major basically became draft deferment to put it off until I uh, graduated and then the inevitable was I was going to go play army and I put it off I graduated and I got a BA and the the official major was history and political science and then I I enlisted and gave him an extra year so that I wouldn't play with guns mm -hmm. um, so you didn't serve in Vietnam or did oh you yeah I did but I didn't play with guns in Vietnam I had a gun for a while and it scared me a lot I I was worried the thing was going to go off and so I tried not to carry it. I was a reporter for Pacific Stars and Stripes newspaper when I was in Vietnam. And I, I traveled around Vietnam. I had what were called blanket travel orders. So they said, what province can you go to? And they listed all of the provinces. And I took military hops around the country and could write whatever I wanted. Very little got published. You would come back to Saigon and teletype it up to Tokyo and then they would use it or not use it. And these were in the waning days of the war. Uh, the United States presence was drawing down. And it's one of the reasons that I was lucky enough to get on with Stars and Stripes was mm -hmm. because they simply were slots available there and, uh, and I could do that. I think if I had been there in 68 or 67, um, my chances of getting with Stripes would have been diminished and my chances of being a information specialist, I was enlisted, information specialist with a uh, battalion out in the field would have been a lot greater. So I was real lucky. Mm -hmm. But I, I graduated from Morningside, did my army time, uh, gave them an extra year, did three years, and then traveled around for a year in East Asia and then came back. What uh, prompted you to get into broadcasting then and weather forecasting? It was kind of by default. All through college, the last couple of years in high school and all through college, I had worked in radio 
as a part-time job. A lot of other guys were sacking groceries and doing things, and I was working at radio stations because when I was in high school, this other kid and I, had to, he had a tape recorder, and we had this great idea, let's go to the radio stations, take the tape recorder, and say, we'll do interviews of high school ball players that you could play at halftime mm -hmm. if your play-by-play -play guys would like a break. Well, we went to, to KMS and they said, no, we've got Gene Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you do, and Gene, Gene ha has that handled. Thanks, boys. <laughs> And we went to KSEJ, and they said, well, that's, that's a very enterprising idea, young men. Maybe we can do that. And we went out to a place called KDVR, which was out on Correctionville Road in Sioux City. And it was at 97.9. And it was owned by a family, a very nice bunch of people. And they uh, programmed it with classical music, with jazz, with country, everything. And they said, no, we don't do ball games, but we need afternoon announcers. Would you, you've got a nice voice. Would you like to come out and be an announcer? Great. Literally walking into the station. And, you know, would you like to be on the radio was just. <laughs> For a high school student, that was wonderful. Right? <laughs> I'd love to. I don't care what kind of uh, station it is. And I got a job there, and then KSCJ called, and they said, we'll give you a try, boys. Would you like to do that? So we went out, and we did high school interviews. We did interviews with ball players, and came back up, and KSCJ played them at intermission, or at halftime. And... Uh, it was a great deal for us. And starting then, I had part-time jobs all through college. I even worked at Channel 9 for three years, answering the telephone at night, back when the station had night receptionists. And, and uh, that was a real bizarre time. I mean, I, I was paid to answer the phone and watch TV. That sounds like a great job. It was a great <laughs> job. And I also had a chance to meet everybody at the station and kind of get to know people at the station, which meant that later on, when I came back, I was really coming back to family. I was coming back to people that I knew. Mm -hmm. So all told, I've probably been at the station for 18 years, if you count them. So when you got back from the service, you went in and said, I had a lot of experience in radio. I'd like to do the weather. No, no. I was unemployed for a long time. Um, I worked at KMNS for a year during the bicentennial. And uh, I did a radio show in the afternoon. And I, was, I really enjoy radio a lot more than I do TV. Radio is fun. Mm -hmm. Radio, you don't have to put a suit and tie on. And radio, you can just be using people's imagination. I think that now too often radio is so formatted and so uninteresting that it wouldn't appeal to me at all. And the difficulties, it's tough to make a living in radio at radio stations. They, but um, radio is more fun. So I went to work at KMNS and I, I, they, they said, we're going, to do, we're going to do a whole year long salute to the nation's bicentennial. And I was, I was amazed. I said, what does that mean? And the, the operations manager said, well, here, let me play you this. And we had a one-minute uh, cart that was nothing but the guy who was the voice of Tony the Tiger singing a song saluting the bicentennial and tailored to Sioux City. And it was Tony the Tiger going, in 76, Sioux City was nothing but the mighty mo. <laughs> and... It went on and on for a minute, and I looked at him and I said, Jeff, you're really going to play this for a year? Yeah, isn't that neat? And I said, people are really going to get sick of that, aren't they, Jeff? Oh, no, it's Tony the Tiger. So, <laughs> so I said, well, if you're so crazy about the bicentennial, then why don't I call myself Captain America? And I was just giving him a hard time. And the more that he reacted to that, the more he said, uh, well, you really wouldn't do that. The little impish Irish part of me comes out and I said, no, no, I could do that. I could be like Captain America. And I didn't care about whether or not Marvel Comics had a problem, but they didn't ever say anything. I'd, and so I, I developed and did a year of, of the Captain America show. And then I started calling it the Bicentennial Giggle. <laughs> and, I, I started calling around the country and using a lot of their long distance time and doing these interviews and they were real formatted and they said uh, at that time, whole different ownership than owns the station now. They said, you know, here's the format. After the song you say, 
the station call letters and the time, and then you do commercials. And then you come back out, you say your name, and then you do more commercials. And then you introduce the next song, and then you come out and you do the stale. It sounds like you were a kind of like a rebel like David Letterman maybe was doing the same yeah, thing. Yeah, we had the same, same approach kind of thing. And I just, I started getting people like Diane Kay, who at that time was writing a column for the Sioux City Magazine called Free to Be Me, and had her come on and kind of redo her column for radio. Because mm -hmm. her columns were really funny. And it was a shame to only have them one time in a Sioux City magazine and never be heard from again. So she came on and kind of did the column. And then I got a kid who really knew comics, and I introduced him as Kevin Comic. And he, he filled us in on comics. And I had another person fill us in on soap operas. And I had another person, you know, just a whole cast of characters. And it went along for the longest time, and eventually they put their foot down and they said, they. I, I had developed a, uh, a, a radio series at that time the movie Jaws had come about. And I developed a radio series and it was about, instead of a, a killer shark, it was about a killer hog in northeast Nebraska and I called it Jowls. Oh, no. <laughs> and Jowls had these horrible grunting sounds at the beginning of it. <laughs> and, I had, I, we recorded them at the station and I brought in all the people that I knew around town that could do voices and wrote like a dozen or two dozen of these things and was going to put them on and the station put their foot down and they said, we want to preview these before you put them on. Well, they hadn't previewed anything so we kind of came to a party in the ways and I got fired then. Oh, no. <laughs> Which is the way you end a lot of jobs in broadcasting. Well, had your ratings gone up with the radio station with all well, this creativity? This is before radio ratings. Oh. We really, if they had ratings, they never shared them with me. Now, uh, radio is, is highly rated. I mean, they, they rate things for months at a time, and I'm sure they know exactly what percentage of the audience they have. We had no clue. I had no idea that people were listening mm -hmm. until I was done with the thing maybe five years, and a lot of people started saying, oh, we used to listen to you. That was unusual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was unusual. That. So from radio, you took your gimmicks on over to no, the SAU? No, no, I was unemployed then for a while. <laughs> and I, during the 76 election, I ended Caminus in the middle of 76, and during the 76 election, I worked for Joanne Soper when she ran for Congress in Sioux City. And very lovely lady. Um, and I, she didn't win, unfortunately, and, and, and so I was out of a job again. And while I was unemployed there, the station called and they said, Leon Pedersen is leaving. Would you like to come down and do a tape and maybe do the weather? And so I came down and I did a tape. And they you. said, why don't you do the weather? And, and that was just very fortunate because I needed work. Now, um, you've brought some of your pointers with you. You're kind of known in Sioux City for your pointers. Show and tell is what this <laughs> That's is, right. yeah. Now, um, how did you get started using pointers? The very first day that I ever did the weather. I'm going to go back. I knew everybody at the station, or most of the people at the station, before I started working there. And so I was going to do uh, a week of the noon weather before I, before I started doing the 6 and 10. And the very first day, the very first noon, the, the uh, people in the newsroom, the studio was in the newsroom, and as you did the weather, people were sitting around you, and kind of watching. And they were all trying to give me a hard time and get me nervous before the first one. So they were saying things like, are you nervous? <laughs> a lot of people get real sweaty. A lot of people really, uh, really uh, have a problem with this and lose their train of thought. Their mouth dries up. Are you nervous yet? <laughs> no. Sounds like good friends. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. No, no, I'm not. Um, so to show them that I wasn't nervous, they turned to me and they said, here's Tom Peterson and he's doing weather this week, Lee Dennis has uh, gone on to other things, and Tom, go ahead. So I started doing the weather. And I was using a pen. I was pointing out what the weather was on the weather map, and we had a commercial in the middle of the weather, and the point was to say, we'll be back with a forecast right after this, meaning the commercials. And I said, we'll be back with a forecast right after this in the commercials, and did this to show them in the newsroom. That you were <laughs> She didn't get to me. You know, <laughs> I can't take this. And didn't think anything of that. 
and came back, did the forecast, and you know, they at the end of it, when we were off camera, said, yeah, hot shot, yeah, that was fine. So I passed their little test of fire. We kept track of phone calls down at the station. People uh, called in saying the usual, who's the new guy, where's the old guy? I like the new guy, I don't like the new guy. People offer their opinions a lot, and that's fine. There was at least one call that said, that was real neat the way he flipped his pen and caught it. And I had to think back, what was, oh, that. So the next day, I did that, said we'll be back with the forecast for the person who called rather than for anybody in the newsroom. And a couple of more people called. So that was real neat, the way he flipped his pen and caught it without looking at it. I just trapped it there. That's an illegal trap in the pointer biz. And I, and I kept doing it, and people kept mentioning, well, you're doing all right in weather, but that's real neat how you flip the pen. So I kept, I thought, well, if people like that, that's great. And then people started giving me pens, and here, why don't you use my pen? That's from Joe Blow Insurance Company, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I can say it's from Joe Blow of Sioux City. I can't say it's from Joe Blow Insurance Company. But I, I thought, this is a great deal, because I'm getting a lot of free <laughs> pens, and I can use pens. And then I went to a game. Um, I think the very first one was actually a snowflake. Somebody said, here, we carved this snowflake out of wood, and, um, and I used that. But then I went to a game, a benefit basketball game, and they said, we noticed you flipped pencils. Here, flip this. And they gave me a, a pencil that was a 4x4 four four whittled down in that long. <laughs> flip this, sucker. Did you flip it? Yeah. <laughs> and as soon as I flipped it, the floodgates just opened and everything pointy mm -hmm. came out of the woodwork. And I've been doing them ever since. So can you show us some of the pointers that you've sure. today? Sure. Sure. Um, I mean, the, the, the pointers can be in any different format. They can be made out of any different thing. And this is just, I brought along a little batch of pointers. I put them in crocs at home. And that's because I'll, you can jam a lot of them in here without busting out the sides. <laughs> so, and also, in case this thing ever, I donate them to something, I'll have a lot of swell crocs out of this right. deal. <laughs> but, um, oh, there's so many. This one, this one is just a gem. This, this one was somebody's idea, Nicole Ludwig, who was from Odebolt. And Nicole, this is, this is obviously a little gaming device. Uh, match it up with what you think the weather is going to be. Mm -hmm. Spin the thing around. Oh, it's going to be excellent weather mm -hmm. if it falls on there. Or let's see what it comes up a second time. Excellent, excellent. again. It's going to be an excellent day. Outside. I'm happy to see that. Um, that's a wood thing. Um, this is a real nice one. I'm probably showing the very nicest. Well, I'll save the nicest one. This one is neat. This was uh, 1983 Centennial at Alton. And if people don't know what this is, it's a giant mock-up of a straight razor oh. that people used when they were before the age of, of uh, battery-powered uh, And did you flip razors. this with the blade out or in? I don't remember. <laughs> it's all gone by in a haze. I don't know. This was handcrafted. He put it on here by Bill Gerlink. Gerlink. And I don't know what, you know, this Bill's, Bill's uh, talent here must have been wood carving, but he really went above and beyond. That's a gorgeous piece of work. A lot of work to um, So people use whatever their handicraft is. If they're, in this case, somebody just whittled something. This, this was Ken Anderson of Cherokee. He went camp, I remember this one. He went camping in Colorado in 1986 with his son. And while they were camping in Colorado, they carved a pointer for me. <laughs> that was nice of him. Yeah, and jammed a pine cone on there, and it became a pointer. And if Ken only knew that I still had that thing <laughs> with me. Some people uh, make yarn, and this is, this is a, a skein of yarn that someone has made. Um, you know, men and women make pointers. Boys and girls make pointers. Older people make pointers. Now, you usually get pointers from individuals, or do you get from pointers from groups when they want things average? All of them are ultimately from individuals. Somebody has to make it, but an awful lot of them are used to advertise a particular thing. And they, they have figured out that they can't go wrong by putting my name on them. <laughs> <laughs> Almost a sure way that you're going right. to get it on TV. So this one, somebody, somebody was into leather crafting, you know, like making belts. Mm -hmm. So they did the little uh, snow cloud and a rain cloud and my name on it, and something else. Oh, a little bucking bronco in here. But I, that's that's an amazing Ronnie Stevens 
out in Leeds. He was in Gary Washington's class at Leeds during one of Leeds' incarnations. This one, somebody saved, somebody saved nothing but beer uh, bottle caps and made it out of beer bottle caps. And Maybe every night when they watched you on the news, they'd drink a beer and save the cap, he says. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that could be. That doesn't go over real well in, in uh, a lot of Sioux County, but it does, <laughs> it does out, out where my uh, ancestors come from in Nebraska and, and South Dakota. Uh, this was something, I, this is some part of a car. Uh, Sioux City Odd Rod Club made this, and they, they, it involved bolting it down and a little bit of, um, a little bit of, of uh, welding. Uh, this is really a nice one. I've gotten a lot of nice toll painting jobbies. Uh, October 88, and this little crafty lady here, see, she has a toll brush, and that moves. And this was celebrating National Toll Month. There is a National Toll Month. Oh, yeah, and, but it, it's tough on everybody. It takes its toll. Or <laughs> <Right. laughs> This is Connie Lanigan of South Sioux City. Um, and I'm sure there. Oh, this this one's real nice. This is a test for everybody here at the college to try and get these and and get away before I put them down. American Business Women's Association at War Eagle Chapter in July '78 did this, and you know it's just carved. But I mean, they went to the trouble of making a little plaque, which I thought was. Is that supposed to look like Floyd Monument? Nah, <laughs> I think this was just somebody said make him something pointy, something that he can hurt himself with. I, I used a uh, lit sparkler one time and lit flipped sparkler? it. lit sparkler? Yeah, caught the wrong end of it. <laughs> and the, the problem with that is I got in trouble with the fire marshal who called down and said, uh, that's illegal to have uh, sparklers or in, incendiary devices, I don't know what he called it, in a building. What, uh, do you recall what your largest pointer has been? My largest pointer was one I never even got to the station. We were given a large, large pointer up uh, in a community in northwest Iowa, and it was so large, none of us could get it in our cars, and we <laughs> left it there. <laughs> a big piece of wood? Or, uh... It was gigantic. I don't remember. It was just real big. And, Thanks. Thanks for the pointer. <laughs> and then left it. <laughs> what about the strangest? There have been so many. It's really tough to see the strangest. Um, I don't know. There, there really have been so many strange pointers. Have you had strange any? and wonderful? <laughs> have you had any pointers that you've had to totally decline? Maybe because I've been amazed. No, there really haven't been. Uh, there have been pointers that you can't use because they just plastered the thing with commercial names, and you really can't plug somebody's business because that would fall under the payola sort of thing. Is somebody giving you money under the table mm -hmm. to plug their business? If they want to plug their business, we have ways of doing that. They're called ads, <laughs> and. Uh, no, we, that, that would be the only instance where it was just so plastered with advertising that I said that. Or when people, you go into a uh, restaurant or tavern and somebody hands you a bar straw, here, flip this. <laughs> and I tell them, I'll go to as much trouble using it as you did in making it. <laughs> That's right. You know, so is, how many pointers do you think you've accumulated through the years? Three or four thousand, I'd say. And you have them all in your home? No, no. <laughs> Some of them don't last. Things like, uh, things like vegetables don't last. I see. Um, it's been a lot of fun over the last few years. It really has. I appreciate the opportunity to be on, on the program today. I'm certainly glad that you came as our guest. And uh, we'll welcome for you to come back anytime you'd like to bring any more pointers with this, you. This is a weekly thing? Uh, well, no, we each take our turn here. Okay. So. I'll be back next time it's your turn. Okay. Thank you. I'm Linda Harchi, and this has been In Touch. My guest has been Tom Peterson, who's the weather director at KCAU. Thanks, Linda.
Touch has been a student project of the television production class at Briarcliff College. 